Okay, we're going to continue on this idea of both the dynamic mode decomposition, Koopman operators, and the idea of embedding nonlinear dynamics in some kind of linear approximation. Okay, so what we had talked about previously is that we had some kind of differential equation. It's nonlinear. And of course, we can do simulations of this. Now, what the DMD algorithm did for us was, which was the first set of lectures on, uh, of this uh, course, is that uh, we were able to take snapshots of our system, Y, and then do a regression onto some linear model, right? So we were able to construct two snapshot matrices. Let's call them capital Y or capital X. Excuse me. So you have X which are snapshots of this vector at different times, all the way to some time m minus 1. And another set of snapshots from time 1 all the way to time m. Right? So the dynamic mode decomposition simply was a regression that said, I want to map my TAM snapshots here to delta some delta t to the future. So each one of these are pairs, and it tells you how they would go from one time to the next time point. And you can do this by saying, well, I want the matrix A that takes me to x prime. Okay? And of course, regression will just simply say uh, that it takes pseudo inverse of both sides, then A is equal to x prime, x pseudo inverse. <coughs> so that's what DMD did. It said, take this nonlinear system, embed it, build basically a linear model. And of course, the linear model may not be that good because, in fact, this is a fully nonlinear system. So what we start talking about is Koopman theory. So let me go back to the calling this, uh, so here, which was to say, what if I work in a new space? Okay. Uh, and actually, I should have made all these little x's. Let's say that's the state of my vector. Sorry, apologies for that. Right? So I have this here. So now the idea with Koopman was to say, maybe I can define a new functional space. So in other words, um, sorry, make this a g of x. I would like to define functions of my state variable x to y, and the idea being that if I can pick g correctly, that maybe what I can do is I'd, re or I'd really like to do this, the following, is to have this. If I pick a good set of observables that I can map to, in fact, a linear system of differential equations. Okay? So that was the idea behind the Koopman idea, which is, Pick, don't work in the original variables. Just because you measured it doesn't make it the right set of variables. Work instead in this new fun uh, function of your observable, of your state space, where the idea is if I can pick a good G, I can actually build a linear embedding. Okay? And in fact, once you have this and snapshots of this new observable Y, then you can just use this DMD algorithm to actually compute the solutions and since it's now mostly a linear system, or it's, you've chosen a good G to make it a linear system, then I have this uh, embedding very nicely. So the hard part is figuring out an appropriate G. This is non-trivial, and in some sense remains a uh, research question to date, which is how do you pick good Gs, good observables of the system, in which that observable set makes the system linear? Now, there's some ways to go with this. Uh, one possibility is you can use what machine learning often does, which is sort of, and the trick that's typically carried out in support vector machine, which is project into some higher dimensional space. So you could make G some just projection into all kinds of higher dimensional space, and the idea would be in that space, the hope is that it would be linear in that space. Okay? Uh, the problem is this becomes exceptionally large system of equations, right? Because now you're projecting what already potentially is 
a very large dimensional, if this is a PDE, for instance, snapshots of a high dimensional system, this becomes essentially computationally intractable. That idea is called the extended DMD. And in fact, that has been used. And you can even use things that you, people used in SVM, which is kernel methods for expanding to high dimensional space. And of course, then you have to cross validate and make sure that works. But that is one possibility of figuring out how to build a linear space, which is to just project into very high dimensional space. I'm going to talk about a very different way to do this. And we're going to come back to the idea of time delay embedding, something that we had talked about previously with model discovery. So what we had talked about with model discovery is I can use time delay embedding to figure out my latent variable space. So you take measurements of a system at that, in that example, what we had shown was the Lorentz equation. And in the Lorentz equation, I have an x and a y and z variable. So suppose I have the x, y, and z time series, but suppose I only can give an x. How do I know there's a y and a z? And when we showed in that example, through time delay embedding, is that you could actually understand through a rank truncation of this Hankel matrix, the time delay embedding matrix, that in fact there was three, two other dominant modes in there, and we could essentially construct some proxy for y and z. But now what we're going to do is use this time delay embedding in a completely different way. We're going to use the time delay embedding as our way to embed our nonlinear system into a linear system. So that's going to be our observable version of g of x. We're going to figure out how to embed this linearly. I'm going to show you this in an example. So let me pull up some code, and we'll start running this code, here it is. So what I'm going to give you as an example of this, it's going to be a numerical computation of this, of this time delay embedding, is we're going to look at the van der Poel oscillator. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to start off the code, a clear all, close all, CLC. I'm going to go ahead and pick a dt of 0.01, and I'm going to go from time 0 to 50 with dt 0.01. So I'm going to get 5,000 time steps into the future, OK? I pick dt.01. Remember, OD45 picks its own time steps. This 0.01 is just what I want it to give to me. This is how we're going to have our time delay embedding is all the shifts are going to be by 0.01. And we can come back and play around with this if we wish. I'm going to also give it some initial state, 0.1 and 5. And mu is a parameter in the van der Poel. I'll show you the van der Poel right-hand side in a moment. But it's parameterized by 1.2. Essentially, this tells you how nonlinear this oscillator is. I'm going to go and solve it with OD45. I'm going to send in the parameter mu, solve it from time 0 to 50, and then I'm going to plot the results here, y1 and y2, okay, and which are going to be my x1 and x2 variables. Notice that when I'm going to do the time delay embedding here, I'm going to assume I have all the time information. So in the, it, before when we were using time delay embeddings, we were trying to discover the latent variable space. Here, we're going to go ahead and assume that I actually know the entire space. It's x1 and x2. It's two degrees of freedom, and I have measurements on both. Okay? So let's go ahead and run this, and you can see what this oscillator looks like. There it is. So this is your nonlinear oscillator. It starts off with some initial state, and it settles on to uh, basically uh, an attractor, which is uh, some limit cycle. And this limit cycle is a nonlinear limit cycle, as you can see here. So these are not looking sinusoidal at all, right? So these are some exotic oscillator modes, OK? So I can see what the dynamics is. And right away, you can see that it's strongly nonlinear, OK? If it was linear, one of the hallmark features of linear systems, right, is that all the dynamics are e to the omega t. So they're all the oscillations are perfectly sinusoidal. So that's a hallmark feature of a linear dynamical system. This is clearly looking like uh, they're not looking sinusoidal. And so this is where you can start seeing the signature of strong nonlinearity. Okay? So this is my system. It's a pretty simple system. And mostly I just want to highlight the idea for you uh, on this simple model. Okay. So this is just looking at the time dynamics here. And what we did with time delay embedding is to take this model and to start shifting and embedding the dynamics um, in a time shifted way. So let's go ahead and start building a model to do this. I'll come back up here, 
close that down. And first of all, I do would like to show you what the right hand side looks like. And here it is. By the way, the right hand side, here it is. It's x2 mu times 1 minus x1 squared plus x2 minus x1. So this mu parameter controls the strength of this 1 minus x1 squared, which is uh, the nonlinearity. Okay? So uh, the bigger mu is, the more nonlinear it is. If mu goes to zero, it's a linear oscillator. Okay? So I've made it pretty strongly nonlinear, and so that's why you see these exotic shapes that are not sinusoidal. All right. So let's go to our code here and start doing some time delay embedding. So what I'm going to do is take my results and build some Han Hankel matrices. I'm going to build two of them just to sort of play around and see how this looks when we do time delay embedding. So I have x1 and x2, and there are 5,000 points in x1 and there are 5,000 points in X2. So what I'm going to do for this time delay embedding, I'm going to go ahead and take the first 4,000 points. So remember the thing, my simulation went from time 0 to 50. This is going to go, this is basically one time string is over 40 units of time. So I go from the first point to 4,000 points. So this is the first 40 time units, X1, X2. So I put them both together, lay them across in the first two rows. The next two rows right here are now shifted over by delta t. So this is from time delta t to 40 plus delta t. That's those next two rows. The next two rows here are shifted over yet again. So this is 2 delta t to 40 plus 2 delta t, and so forth and so on. So what I have here is a total of six time delay embeddings. Now, if you remember last time when we were looking at this from the point of discovering latent variables, we didn't time delay very much, embed very much. And here, again, we're not, we're only doing six delay embeddings, and we want to take a look at this before that was enough to reveal to us that, in fact, we had these latent variables, that we had a y and a z. The rank was three of that matrix, which told us something about the missing variables that were there. So I'm going to do the six delay embedding, and I'm also going to do a delay embedding of 10, just to make it a little bigger. So there it is. And I'll show you how to automate this to put as many time delay embeddings as you want. But here, just, you know, again, just time delay embed. So I just want to see the structure. Though I have the eight Hankel matrix H1, Hankel matrix H2. So with six delay embeddings, 10 delay embeddings, and what we're going to look at is start looking at the difference between these two and see specifically when you think about that Hankel matrix, what we did previously is we did the SVD of that Hankel matrix to look at the low rank structure, and then we could look at truncating the low rank structure with the dominant modes and see what those modes look like to describe the evolution dynamics that we see in that nonlinear oscillator. So here is the bulk of that. Figure three, I'm going to first take the SVD of the first Hankel matrix. This has six delay embeddings, and I have U, S, and V. Now, S is going to tell me something about the singular value structure and about the rank. So the first thing I'm going to do here in subplot 211 is I'm going to plot, in fact, what the singular value spectrum looks like. What you anticipate is that there should be two modes that dominate. It's a, it's a two-dimensional oscillator. So we'll look at that. Okay? I'm also going to plot here in figure four a couple of things. I'm going to plot the first three U left singular vectors and right singular vectors. In other words, the first three columns of U, first three columns of V. The first three columns of U are my eigenspace in this Hankel space. Now it's interesting, right, because U now is a time delay embedding coordinate, so it's the coordinate, so it's the eigenvector in this time delay embedding. So it's a little bit more difficult to interpret, right, because if you think about the pairs, it's x1, x2, but then shifted by delta t by delta t, that's what this U vector is trying to look at, is the correlation structure among that matrix. The more interesting variable here, or more interpretable for us, at least in this context of time delay, is V. The first three columns of V, this tells you what the dominant correlated structures are in time. 
So what we should see in V is sort of these dominant structures allowing us to reconstruct the time series we saw before of that oscillator. Okay, I'm going to plot those both. And I'm also going to plot here in figure three, do the same thing, but now with not the Hankel matrix H1, but Hankel matrix H2. So six delay embeddings, 10 delay embeddings. And I'm going to compare the U's and the V's. And one other thing I'm going to do here in figure 77 is I'm going to compare the first two modes of the time modes of the six delay embedding and 10 delay embedding. So I want to take a look at this, right? So in fact, let me make these also line width two so you can see them a little better. All right, so I'm going to run this. I'm, going to, I'm just going to put that command there, so just stop this thing. All right, here we go. So I'm going to run this thing. The stop command, by the way, just it crashes there. I just want the code to stop there before we proceed on. Okay, so let's walk through some of these pictures. Let's start here. What you're seeing here is the singular value spectrum of the six time delay embedding, the 10 time delay embeddings. Okay? Uh, so first of all, what you see, both tell you that they're in fact two dominant modes, which is expected. After all, it's two-dimensional oscillator, so you expect that to happen. What's maybe a little surprising is that there is this third mode coming on. Right? So if you remember from before when we did time delay embedding with Lorenz, just using the x variable, we found that it was dominated by three modes, and that fourth mode was tiny. Here, you know, this third mode is not quite tiny. You might want to keep it around. The rest look to be pretty small. And in fact, here's what's kind of interesting. You already see a signature of it here, which is, if you look, this mode here, third mode here, uh, I'll show you in a minute that is actually uh, the comparison. This is a little bit more off of the zero than this one. So in other words, this third mode, as you time delay bed more, this third mode is coming off of that. It's starting to capture more of the variance. Okay? There are consequences to this, and let's, we'll, we'll show those in a minute. But anyway, this is the SVD. You can see the 10 delay embedding, the 6 delay embedding. They both have dominant two modes, but the third mode doesn't you might be able to truncate it off to get a reasonable approximation, but you also might want to keep it around to improve your uh, approximation. Okay? So that's what this shows. So now let's come to looking at the, the actual dynamics. So here's figure four. This is these are the U's, the first three columns of U, these are the first three columns of V. Okay, so first of all, there's an issue about interpreting what that means. The fact that you have this zigzag structure makes sense, right? Because really this variable set, one, two, is the same as this one, one, two, same as this one, one, two, right? Because they're just time delay embeds of each other. So that at least makes some sense, especially for the first two modes, which are the U1 and U2. And then, of course, there's a little something more interesting going on there in that third mode. Okay? Well, at least the first two modes seem to have a very nice correlated structure, which is every other column is associated with each other because the, they're time delay embeds of each other. Like it's X1 and then X2, and then X1 and X2, all time delay embedding, so you see that structure repeated. Does that make sense there? And then here are the time modes. So again, the two dominant, the red and the blue, and you can see they have this very interesting structure. Let me zoom in on it because I think you know, clearly you can see what that this nonlinear oscillator modes. Hold on a minute here. All right, here we go. That should do it, but let's see here, it's not responding. To zoom in. Okay, well. Be that as it may, this, these are sort of in some sense 
you can think about those nonlinear oscillators that we showed before as being sums of these type of modal structures. Now notice, one way to think about it is if I have that time series that we saw before with the oscillator, this is your basis, your low rank basis that you can reconstruct those in. So you only need two or three modes and you're going to do a very good job reconstructing that time series. There, oh, okay, it's a little slow, sorry. Uh, Not sure why it's, will it come back? So anyway, those are, they're clearly strongly nonlinear looking functions. They're clearly not looking like sinusoids at all. Okay, there you go. Now, if I delay in bed with 10, you get something very similar looking. And here it is. Let me try to zoom in on this one. Maybe this will work this time. There we go. So there you go. So these are like these oscillations. In fact, they look very similar to the six embedding. Um, and again, kind of more exotic basis functions, but you can expand your solution in these modes. If you have just the two modes, it's going to capture 98% of the variance, or 97, 98% of the variance in just these two modes. Okay? They're not sinusoidal. So what's the point so far? The point so far is this is a strongly nonlinear system. It's a simple van der Poel. It's nonlinear, and a linear embedding is not going to work. Why? Because these don't look like sines and cosines. That's the bottom line. And I tried to time delay embed this, and you can see the time delay embedding gives me a rank two structure, but clearly strongly nonlinear. So a DMD approximation is not going to work well. So I don't have a good Koopman observable set. If I had a good Koopman observable to go with, then I could do DMD and the linear, the linear model would be a good proxy for the dynamics. Here, of course, that's not going to work well at all because this is very far from linear, very far from sinusoids. Okay? So now what we're going to do is say, well, let's go ahead and time delay embed even more. Oh, sorry, and I meant to show you also one other thing. Sorry. which is the comparison, here it is, between the, times, the, the time modes of the six delay embedding and the 10 delay embedding. And here they are. There's the two, the first mode and the second mode, uh, and the difference between the two. You can see they're slightly different when I do six delay embeddings versus 10 delay embeddings. So there's something going on there, right? So if I delay embed more, it changes what the low rank structure looks like. So I'm going to show you, if you just keep time delay embedding, what's this going to deform to? Okay, let me take that out here. All right, so now let's write some code to do something more sophisticated. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make a new matrix H3. And this is going to be our Hankel matrix. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to delay time delay embed by 900. Okay? So this time delay embedding, by the way, is dependent upon what your step 0.01. I, I pick 0.01 as my DT, right? So if I make my step bigger, like 0.05, then I don't have to delay embed as much as I do here. But if I have 0.01 as my time step, which you might have a very finely resolved time steps in your, non, in your model, here, when I do the time delay embedding, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 900 time delay embeds. Instead of just 6 or 10 I did before, I'm going to take this matrix H3, which is empty. I'll make H3 is what it was now. And what I'm going to do is add Y of J to 4,000 plus J. So in other words, take the first, take a block of 4,000 points and keep shifting it over by 1. So it's from 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 4,000 plus 1, 4,000 plus 2, and so forth. Okay. And I just take y as my solution to the nonlinear oscillator. And I take both column, both, uh, uh, both, both of the columns that come out of that solution out of OD45, I transpose it to make it a big vector this way. Remember, when it comes out of OD45, it's a big, long column vector with x1 and x2. So I pull out blocks of 4,000, I lay them on their side, and that's how I build this matrix H3. So this is going to be a big matrix. 
Okay? So it's going to have, if I time delay bed 900 times, and each embedding has two variables, right? So I have about 1,800 rows by 4,000 columns. Okay? So it's a pretty big matrix. Not that big a deal, right? It's, I mean, this, it's not going to have any problem handling it in MATLAB. But if you were trying to time delay embed a partial differential equation where instead of the state is two variables, maybe the state is a thousand variables and you do this time delay embedding, well now you're going to get something very large, right? Be, it, instead of a thousand variables times 900, right, then you're going to get a uh, pretty close to a million uh, matrix in size, okay? Times the number of snapshots. So it can get very big very quickly, okay? But here it's not that big, and I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to go ahead and SVD it. I'm going to plot this. some of the, look at the, the diagonal decay, and I'm going to look at the modes. Exactly the same thing I did previously with the 6 and the 10 delay embedding. All I've done now is just delay embedded a very long time. So the question is, what results from that? So let's take a look. So we're going to run it. It's running. So these are the previous figures we plotted. And this will come be done in a minute here. It is a big, bigger matrix, so it does take a bit to compute that SVD. Okay. There. Okay. So first of all, Let's start here. It's the first figure you want to look at. And this is the singular value spectrum. Apologies, it's on the subplot, but that's fine. Let's zoom in on the singular values. Okay, so first of all, let's even zoom in more. So I can. So there they are. So first of all, those two modes stick around. I have two dominant modes. But look what happened. I now pick these two up, these two, and there is something around, you know, this thing doesn't hit that line for about uh, at least uh, 10 or 11, 12 modes. Okay? So all of a sudden, when I've done this time delay embedding, my system that was two-dimensional in some sense in this nonlinear space here, in this massively time-delayed system, coordinate system, I have 12 modes, okay? And of course, the question I'm going to ask is, what are these 12 modes now? Before I could do a rank 2 reconstruction, I'm, remember, I'm trying to reconstruct the same thing. I'm just trying to do a reconstruction of these two uh, nonlinear oscillator modes. And before I could do it with two modes that were these exotic looking modes, and I could just write down the time series as a function of these two modes. But now it's giving me 12 modes to represent this solution. And what do these 12 modes look like? Well, here is the magic of time delay embedding. I am plotting for you the top three modes of the U and the V. The most important thing and the most striking thing that I want you to walk away with is this picture right there. Do you see these time functions? What do they look like to you? They look like sines and cosines to me. In other words, by time delay embedding enough, what I've done is I've now produced a Fourier basis in time. These are sinusoids. What is the hallmark signature of sinusoids in time? Linear system. So what I've done is by time delay embedding, I've created a coordinate system in which that nonlinear oscillator, the Van der Poel oscillator, becomes linear. I have an awesome Koopman embedding. Okay? In other words, I figured out how to take that nonlinear oscillator and make it linear. Not by a coordinate transform, not by saying y is some g of x, but by time delay embedding. And by time delay embedding, I now have a rank, let's say, 12 system 
with a bunch of Fourier modes in time. What this means is I can write down a DMD model that will give me a model for predicting the future of that oscillator, right? That's the whole goal, right? You want to take this data, you want to time delay embed it, have a linear coordinate system that becomes a very good metric or a very good model for producing forecasts. And I just showed you how to do it. You take the system, you time delay embed it, in this time delay embedding coordinate, it's linear. I can now build a DMD model for this thing. With that DMD model, I can predict, predict, predict the future, and then I can come back out and put it back into the original coordinate system and give you a very good prediction of your system. In fact, for systems that are quasi-periodic, this time delay embedding gives you an exact DMD model, an exact linear representation. This is not even an approximation anymore. In this coordinate system, this thing is exact. I have an exact DMD embedding, an exact Koopman embedding. So it's fantastic. That's what this means. That's what those sinusoids mean here in this time delay embedding. Notice how much I had a time delay embed it to get it, but I got it. These are the U modes. They're solid like this because they have lots of oscillations. A little bit harder to interpret, but it doesn't matter. This just gives me a coordinate system to go back into the original variable set. And I'm actually only interested in actually the first two rows because that was the original variable, x1, x2. Everything else was just that thing shifted. Okay? So in fact, this kind of looks like, uh, I made a joke class. This looks like 70s art. You could like print that off, hang it up in your house, and people would be like thinking you're from the 70s or you grew up in the 70s like I did. Um, so this is a, an alternative view. So this is now the second lecture on time delay embeddings. And you can see that time delay embeddings for dynamical systems are a really fantastic data-driven architecture for exploring dynamical systems because you can pull out so much interesting information. And notice I don't know what the model is, right? So this is a very different thing that we were trying to do before, which is discover the model. All I did here was I discovered a coordinate system and in this coordinate system, my model is linear. I don't know what the Vanderpool oscillator is here. All I know is if I delay and delay embed, I have a good linear model describing this Vanderpool oscillator. And that's sufficient for me in this data driven approach to make future state predictions and forecasting uh, um, uh, kind of dynamic, uh, forecasting dynamic systems. Okay, so that's it for now. Go time delay embed some other interesting system. You'll find some, I think, some interesting results.